So I'm here with Dr. Richard Nisbet, and you've probably heard about Dr. Nisbet's research in various places, whether it's cultural differences of reasoning, or how people sometimes fabricate reasons when asked to explain one or another decisions, or how many people seem systematically susceptible to reasoning errors. Much of this research was contributed by Dr. Richard Nisbet and his colleagues, and you can read about it in one of Dr. Nisbet's many books, from Rules of Reasoning to The Geography of Thought, How Asians and Westerners Think Differently and Why, Intelligence and How to Get It, Why Schools and Cultures Count, and many, many more volumes. Before this conversation, I read Dr. Nisbet's most recent book, Thinking, a Memoir. So this conversation is just a hint of what that book and the other books contain. So I encourage you to go uh, check out those books and the most recent book, Thinking, a Memoir. Thanks for joining me, Dr. Nisbet. Thank you. So you uh, have done a lot of work with a lot of different fields. You, you have a kind of interdisciplinary approach. And one of the things that you have done in your career has had a dramatic impact on philosophers and various collaborations with philosophers. And some of that has resulted in this work that's come to be known as experimental philosophy or even uh, more specifically experimental epistemology. So I was wondering if you could kind of tell us how you got into this interdisciplinary work and how your work ended up uh, involving and even shaping philosophy? Well, I had some uh, knowledge of philosophy um, when I started you know, being a professional psychologist. Uh, but when I got really serious about it is I, <clears throat> I, I was studying inductive inferences um, and the errors that people make in inductive inferences. So I started to read an induction among philosophers. And I come across the, the, the uh, uh, idea from Hume uh, that we sometimes make a complete induction from a very small bit of evidence. And sometimes we don't make a complete induction even with a very large amount of evidence. So I said, why is that? And I said, well, you, know, you can frame that in a statistical sense to say, <clears throat> if the thing you're targeting is something that you understand to not be variable, uh, a single sample will do you. And if it's a thing that you take it for granted that it's uh, highly variable, then you realize you've got to have lots of evidence uh, to get it. And so I claim that solves Hume's riddle of induction. Uh, I couldn't have written it for philosophers by myself. Uh, just sheer accident. Paul Thagard was at the University of Michigan, uh, Dearborn, and I told him the idea. And he says, right, you've got it. it. It does exactly what you say it does. And he wrote it up uh, for a philosophy journal, and I put my name on it, too. <laughs> so that's how I got uh, interested in it. But I, I, I was... Uh, um, I, I actually started uh, at Yale teaching, right my first couple, three years, uh, teaching a course that I called experimental epistemology. And then I continued that with uh, Fagard, and then I was in a uh, faculty seminar with Steve Stitch and Al Goldman, who at that time uh, were at Michigan. And so we talked a lot about how experimental psychology could speak to tr traditional uh, philosophical questions. One thing that um, comes to my mind is this idea of experimental epistemology, maybe even preceding some of the experimental epistemology that occurred in philosophy later on, is how the way people think about beliefs and judgments and things like knowledge may be influenced by the, the, the way they were raised or the, the cultural context they grew up in. And, you know, some of your research studies these cross-cultural differences in the way people think. So I wonder if you could say how you got into the cross-cultural work and uh, maybe what you think about some of the, the more recent research on this. So, for example, um, I've, you know, I've been seeing papers even more recently by Kitty Yama and colleagues, including, and including you, showing that a lot of these differences hold up in even larger scale and more recent studies, um, suggesting that there really is something here that's, um, you know, uh, uh, worth considering when we're thinking about the way people think, whether it be about um, 
epistemology and philosophy, or maybe even about the way people think uh, more broadly? Uh, well, it, there's a straightforward story there, actually, pretty clear. Um, I was asked uh, to uh, give a series of lectures at Beijing University um, in 1982. Uh, and in preparation for going to China, I read a lot about Chinese thought. Uh, and um, I and in Chinese history, and a little bit about Chinese culture. Uh, I don't know if it actually prepared me any of that for the my time in China. I certainly didn't know when I was in China, I had no inkling that these folks were really thinking in a different way from me and other Westerners. And, uh, but there was this undergraduate uh, there who could barely speak English and he kept wanting to come and talk to me and although he could hardly speak English it was clear this guy was very very smart and I could eventually get his questions and we talked several that turned out to be Kai Ping Pong um, who's now by the way the dean of social sciences uh, at Tsinghua University which is a more distinguished university even than Beijing University but um, he came to work uh, as a student with me at Michigan. Uh, and after we had been working together for a while, he said, you know, Dick, you and I think in very different ways. And I said, well, tell me more. And what he, he, I don't know exactly what he said, but it was something like the basic hypothesis of holistic versus analytic reasoning, which, I mean, he said, basically, you know, you think very logically, you focus on some object uh, or person or idea uh, and uh, uh, and you don't pay that much attention to the context of things uh -huh. well okay so let's sort of let's test some of these ideas and uh, and that started a string of research which was remarkable in that uh, first of all it was remarkable that not only this this guy this incredibly brilliant guy comes to work with me, but it started a string of brilliant people from East Asia. And so far as I can tell, the first ones had no idea that we were good, that they, I was doing research on uh, Asian versus Western ways of thinking. Uh, but at any rate, these terrific people came. And uh, some of the earliest work uh, was on what uh, Pung called dialectical reasoning um, and uh, he thinks that's the key to understanding eastern versus western thought uh, he says you know a westerner confronted with an apparent contradiction has got to get rid of it <laughs> and he does that by deciding a is correct and to hell with b so the chinese approach is to say hmm a and B, they're contradictory. What can I learn from that? Or is it possible it could be A and B at the same time? Or could the truth lie somewhere between A and B? And he called that, I think quite correctly, dialectical thinking. So that was, and we did lots of studies showing uh, that he was absolutely right about that. <clears throat> uh, and then there were a series of studies, uh, which I started with Takahiko Masuda, uh, and one day he just casually mentioned, says, oh, you know, when, when Asians look at, 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 at the world, you know, they see the whole thing. They see a lot at once and, and Westerners just zero in on the thing they're most interested in. And I said, oh, really? No kidding. Let's demonstrate that. And he says, oh, everybody knows that. I said, no, Taka, <laughs> everybody doesn't know that, but we're going to show, and then a lot of people will anyway. So the first study we did was to show people underwater scenes for 20 seconds, and then we turned them off and said, tell me what you just saw. Westerners say, well, I saw three big fish swimming off to the left. They had fins on their backs and on their bellies uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, more detail about 
those fish, which were the most salient object. Uh, the Japanese subjects, and this is true for East Asian subjects in general, uh, would almost always start with the context. They would say, well, I saw what looked like a stream, the water was green, there were rocks and shells on the bottom, there were three big fish swimming off to the left. <clears throat> then after we've shown them lots of these things to them, uh, we show them uh, particular objects, fish or you know, whatever that were, had been in the scenes or not, and ask them, did you see this anywhere in the, the films we gave you? And uh, if the object was shown in its original context, the Japanese were correct. If it was shown in a different context, they said that they hadn't seen it before. They were more likely to do that, to make that error. <clears throat> For the Americans, it didn't make any difference at all whether you showed them the context or not. Actually, they were trivially better if you gave them no context at all. <laughs> it's as if the percept was not object plus field. The percept was the object. Field was not, not relevant. I can toss that out. And when you look, put, uh, uh, I, uh, contact tracers on people to see where they're looking at a still photo. The Westerner looks, focuses at various points on the, on the picture uh, the, of the central object and rarely looks at all to the context. The East Asian looks a lot of at, at the central object, but looks a lot at the context and a lot of context to object back and forth. Um, so uh, the reason they see different things uh, from us uh, is that uh, they're looking at different things. They see a different, I mean, it's really quite astonishing. They really, they, they're, they're walking through the world seeing <laughs> the context and it's as if we had horse blinders on and we're just looking ahead at the interest, most interesting uh, object. This has... Well, anyway, so that's how I got into it. And those are some of our early findings. Indeed. And, uh, at, you know, at some point you were studying, um, uh, well, Kai Ping and Marcus and, and, and people in this uh, domain were studying uh, other types of ways that Chinese people might look at kind of situational or more holistic factors and how Americans might uh, look at other factors. And so uh, one example you mentioned in, in the new book, Thinking, is how... Chinese uh, people would explain behavior of mass murderers um, in terms of like their relationships with the people uh, that they murdered and, and maybe some other people uh, and, the, and the situation around that. Whereas Americans were much more likely to hone in on the personality traits or other motives of the murderer as opposed to like the, the broader picture. Um, right. and so it seems like, you know, the, the, the type of psychological differences you're getting at have implications for the way we look at like very high stakes uh, situations that uh, impact things like court decisions. Uh, well, it, that kind of difference, explaining the, the world preferentially in terms of the attributes of the, of the principal actor, rather than the context, including the relationships and the history that the person has and, uh, and the context at the time of action and so on. It's, it's really very dramatic. And, and, uh, and it actually makes Asians right in a lot of situations where Westerners are wrong, uh, there's a classic experiment in social psychology where you have uh, a subject watch a video of somebody arguing in favor of some topic, you know, legalization of marijuana or whatever, or giving a speech opposed to that. And you tell the subject before he sees the video, you say, that the, an experimental psychologist asked this guy to give a talk in that, uh, or a debate coach said, I want you to give the pro argument for those things. And now you ask the subject after that's, he's heard the whole speech, how do, how do you think that guy actually feels about the topic? And they'll, <laughs> if they saw a, a pro speech, they say, oh, he, he's probably pretty pro. If they saw anti, well, he's probably pretty anti. Now, 
that's in a way that's not allowed. I mean, the correct answer is there. Who the hell knows that <laughs> the debate coach told him to do it. So it's an error. Uh, the, so, the social psychologist Dan Gilbert once said uh, the fundamental attribution error, which is what these people were doing, the error that they were making is universal. And if there are Martians, they will show the fundamental attribution error. <laughs> well, sure enough, uh, South Koreans do show the error. But then, uh, and I, I would never in the world have thought to do this experiment, in Chai, uh, <laughs> um, did that experiment, or he first put the subject through the same thing, said, I want you to argue for you know, a, a, an anti-abortion speech or whatever. And then they show them this tape. And then they ask them, how do you suppose the guy feels about that? This has no effect on the Americans. They, they learn nothing from having been forced to give a speech pro-abortion or anti-abortion. Uh, the Koreans don't make the error at all. If they've been put through the situation. Now that that's hugely important. I mean, that means they're seeing the situation at work in a target individual, even if that target individual is themselves, um, and uh, and and learning a lesson from it. So it's it's a very it, it's you can know, you can just do studies till the cows come home, uh, showing uh, this this point, that they, they're sensitive to situations, they're sensitive to relationships among people in that situation. They're just, uh, it's not just visually they're seeing more. I mean, they're conceptually they're seeing more. I mean, they're just figuring it out. They've got the context. Very different. It's interesting you were uh, talking there at the end about, um, you know, their, their thought processes. Um, as they were answering these questions uh, about the stimuli in the experiment. And um, it kind of got me thinking a bit about um, some of your other work on introspection, right? So, you know, you and, and various other people have shown that if you ask people to explain their reasoning, uh, they, were, they will very often give you a story about their reasoning that just can't be what was actually going on in their head when they were <clears throat> making whatever decision you were asking about. And, you know, this seems to suggest that like some of our uh, so-called introspective thinking um, doesn't seem to be fully accurate, or at least its purpose isn't accuracy or something like that. And so, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about talking to you, the person who is largely responsible for showing this, I, I find myself feeling a little sheepish because I find myself wanting to ask you about why you made certain decisions uh, in certain research uh, or like, you know, uh, aspects of life or career realizing that um, you have a view uh, that would uh, like a meta view about what your answer to that question is going to be. Right. Um, but in general, I wonder if you could talk about, you know, your, your work on introspection and maybe talk a little bit about the, the boundaries of when introspection maybe is more or less accurate and, and why, uh, so we can try to get a better grasp of like what your work shows and, and when we might be able to trust our introspection, if at all. Right. Well, let me give you a couple of examples. They're, they're the, the knockdown examples of the point that Tim Wilson and I made in that research. <clears throat> uh, one was done almost 100 years ago <clears throat> at the University of Michigan. Uh, a psychologist has, brings people into a room where there's various objects strewn about, and there's a, <clears throat> a rope hanging from the ceiling two ropes actually. And the subject has the job of tying those two ropes together, but he can't, if he grabs one rope and tries to bring it to the other, it's not, he's not quite close enough to tie it. So he's got to somehow get those two ends of the rope together. There are lots of ways of doing that. Um, <clears throat> um, for example, tying on an extension cord on uh, to one of the ropes and then pulling it over. <clears throat> uh, after the subject has been stumped for a while, he's tried all the ways he can think of, uh, the experimenter who's been wandering around the room casually puts one of the ropes into motion and swings it. Then typically within 45 seconds of that, 
the subject grabs a pair of pliers or something, ties it to one of the ropes, set it, sets it to swinging like a pendulum, goes to the other rope, grabs the pendulum, and ties it to two ends together. And then he said, that's great. How, 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 did you, uh, how, how did you happen to think of that? And uh, so a lot of his subjects were psychologists, actually. So he got some pretty amusing stories. He said, well, you know, uh, I, I thought of the situation of monkeys swinging through trees. And th that imagery occurred simultaneously with the idea of setting things. So then he asks him, oh, well, I feel I can see that tension. So do you think that the fact that I put that rope into motion, you think it had any influence? He says, no, 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 it was the monkeys. It was the monkeys all the way. <laughs> so they have no idea the stimulus that caused them to come up with this response. Another study, again, knocked down. We have a, a, a you show people a matrix. So, two by two matrix, just four boxes. Uh, and uh, the subject's job is to predict where an X will appear. This is on a computer screen. Um, and um, that's it, the subject sits there. He says, okay, trial, tip, where, here, give me your response. And he says, well, I think it'll be on the lower right. Nope, no, it's in the upper left. And he keeps doing this. And it turns out there's a, an elaborate series of the rules. So the, an X can never appear in the same box twice. An X can never appear in box one unless it's just previously uh, been you know, come up in box three. Subjects have no idea what these rules are. Um, and we know that they're following the rules because when you change the rules, their performance falls apart. At that point, the experimenter says, gee, uh, God, you were doing so well there. Um, why do you suppose? He says, I don't know, I, I just lost the rhythm. Oh, I see. Uh, so here's this, the subject has learned very complicated rules, which would have, by the way, been very hard to, if, even if he were writing stuff down and try, trying his best to solve that problem consciously, it, it, probably, it probably would have had a lot of trouble. It probably was much easier for them to do it strictly on the unconscious. Okay, so how does this map on to everyday life? When are we gonna be right and when are we gonna be wrong? And our answer to that was to say, if we've got a theory of the behavior uh, that happens to be correct, and that's the theory we give as our answer, then you've got it. But it's not from introspection. We cannot observe cognitive processes. I mean, that sounds radical, but uh, I believe it. Uh, and uh, to make it a little bit easier for people to accept that, I say, well, you know, we have no, um, we don't claim to have access to memory processes. It isn't, well, I, you know, I thought of this thing and then I kind of thought of another thing and then I went digging in this pile of memories and I, you know, it's just, just bang, it's either there or not. I mean, <laughs> we, we can't observe our memory process. The same thing is true of perception. I don't know how it is that something gets from my eyeball to my visual cortex. I mean, uh, all I know is it's there. I mean, and, that, and the same thing is true. And then I'll, I'll make an evolutionary argument, which is why should we be able to examine directly our cognitive processes? I mean, that, that's, that's a hell of a lot of, of machinery uh, to build in. That's really quite unnecessary. It doesn't matter whether I you know, know how to do X or not, or whether I consciously know what the rules are. Um, and uh, it just, matters that uh, that I that I do know them. And then I'll a final point on this, unless you want to ask more, and I'm, I can talk <laughs> forever about this topic. Herbert Simon, who's the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist, psychologist, organizational theorist, was doing research when Tim and I were doing our research, where he would have subjects think out loud uh, as they were solving problems. And he said, here, I've, I've got the tracing. I know what the cognitive processes were, just because I'm getting the subject's comments in real time. Um, and uh, 
Uh, we did lots of studies that made that seem implausible. But actually, Simon, in conversation, Simon gave me the best possible example of what we're talking about. He says he, he was a chess player, and he says, if you set someone down on a chessboard and ask him to play a game, they'll start moving the pieces around and they'll play the game as well as they can. At the end, they'll say, tell me what the rules were that you were following and making your choices. Or he, he can stop, they'll make a choice and say, why did, did you do, why did you move? I have no idea why I did it. They can't tell you, they, they cannot tell you why they did what they did, but Simon can because there is something called duffer strategy. Everybody uses it when they play <laughs> that game the first time. So, totally unconsciously, they're following rules. Then if they become a chess player, they, they read the books, they talk to people who are doing it, they're now beautifully articulate about why they do what they do. I mean, they're, they, they're quite conscious of what the rules are, not because they're observing them, but because they know the rule <laughs> and they know they applied, they applied it in this case, not because they can see the cognitive processes. Then, if the guy keeps up with chess, uh, becomes a master, he's now inarticulate again. He thinks he knows the rules he's using, but he doesn't. He's quite mistaken. So there couldn't be a better demonstration of how wrong Simon was in his theory of not being able to observe cognitive processes uh, and how right we were, if I say so. Yeah, so this is really interesting. So uh, one of my advisors was a student of Simon's and was very in interested in this think aloud tradition. And uh, and one thing I liked about uh, what you do in the book and, and your work more generally is you, you provide, uh, you know, a theory for what, what's going on here. And you just alluded to it. It's this idea that, you know, if we don't necessarily have a, a theory of, of what we should expect a mind to be doing in this situation, then we might um, just kind of grasp for th things that could make sense of the decision we just made. Um, and one thing I started thinking is, well, um, as, as people become more aware of the type of research you're doing, I wonder if there could be a way in which your own theory about introspection becomes more widespread. And so people begin to maybe anticipate that when they're asked to introspect, they might think, oh, well, Nisbet and Wilson and, and, and everyone have been showing me that whatever I'm about to say can't be right. And I wonder if that could somehow impact what they say when you ask them to introspect in a way that could actually improve their introspection. So maybe rather than saying like, well, why, why might I have done that? They might think, well, what was I thinking in that moment? And then try to string together, um, you know, a more plausible story from what they actually remember thinking in the moment, as opposed to like a rationalization of what they did post hoc. Right. Yeah. Well, that, that's a lovely idea. Um, I, um, uh, certainly, people ever ask do, does this affect the way you behave and and the answer is yes sometimes people will ask me why i did x and i will if it's a psychologist i'll say well remember i'm nisbet of nisbet and wilson <laughs> so i don't really know here's my theory of why i did that and it's i'm not lying to you i'm i i, 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 I but I don't know. Ask my wife. She's a, she's at least as likely to know why I did X as I am. <clears throat> um, you don't do this with non-psychologists because they start getting a little edgy and moving toward the door. If you say, I don't know why I did that, I'll, I'll make up a story for you. <laughs> so, uh, but actually the work has had at least some impact. I don't know how much uh, in the legal profession, uh, saying, you know, uh, people are often asked in trials, what were you thinking and what might, made you do that? And, and the, there are a couple of articles that say that this work by Tim and me uh, means you should be very reluctant to swallow hook, line, and sinker, any story that somebody tells, even though you know that person is trying his best to tell you the truth. So another uh, area of interest um, that really stood out to me in the book actually is your research on, you know, you have a, a broad uh, array of research on reasoning and various uh, tasks and the various errors that people make. Um, and sort of as uh, related to that, you have a lot of research uh, related to intelligence more generally. And 
you know, you talk in the book about reading the favorite, the famous Jensen paper from, you know, something like 50 years ago, and how other pieces of, of literature, such as like the book The Bell Curve um, in the late 20th century, started talking about intelligence. And one thing I really liked about your book is you show us how a lot of the terms in this literature, such as heredity, can make people think something quite different than what is actually the case, because heredity gets used in a way that people uh, are likely to think is purely genetic when it might not necessarily be. Um, and you basically list out like uh, a series of claims and theses that were common at some point in the intelligence literature and kind of show how the, it's not quite the case based on a more careful treatment of the evidence and, and uh, understanding of the, of the concepts. And obviously you can't rehearse all of that right now, but I wondered if you could say a little bit of, uh, of, of, about that in order to kind of clarify maybe some of the misleading claims or mis misleading ideas or concepts that have, have come of the intelligence literature that, you're, that a more careful treatment might uh, dispel. The first thing I could say is when people hear something like intelligence is or IQ, and that's a whole other story, but I mean, IQ and intelligence ain't the same thing. Uh, intelligence is much broader. Uh, than IQ, than the kind of thing that IQ tests tap. Uh, but when they hear IQ is 60% heritable, they'll then try to say, I see, okay, so my intelligence is 60% due to genetics and 40%, no, 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 that that's, makes as little sense <clears throat> as to say that the area of a rectangle is 60% length and 40% with. No, that's not, it's nonsensical. I mean, uh, heritability refers to the percent of variation in the population due to genes. Uh, and, uh, and then this point is made beautifully by work uh, done by uh, Eric Turkheimer, who's a very famous genetic psychologist. And He's shown that in the US, um, heritability of IQ is very substantial for upper middle class people. About for the upper middle class population, IQ variation is about 80% due to genes. In the lower part, the lowest, what, bottom 10 or 15% of socioeconomic status, uh, heritability is zero. Uh, now, how could this be? Well, uh, this is this. Now, this becomes the story I tell, not necessarily the story he tells. But upper middle class families uh, are like Tolstoy's happy families. They're all alike. I mean, <laughs> they're all doing the same kind of uh, cognitive socialization, uh, and. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith's family is not any much different from Dr. Jones' family or Lawyer Smith's family. Um, and with respect to how, what kind of thing is going on in the home and in the neighborhood and in the schools. For lower class people, uh, the quality of the environment ranges from as good as you would ever find in an upper middle class family to chaotic and disruptive in every respect. So you have huge environmental variation. And if, if that's the case, that it's the environment that's driving the bus uh, and genes don't have much to contribute. Or to, to put it another way, even if a kid has got a lot of raw smarts in there somewhere, if you put him in a perfectly terrible environment, he's not gonna be able to pick up stuff that will make him do well on an IQ test. So um, now there's a new wrinkle on that, which is uh, that it turns out that in Northwestern Europe, especially Scandinavia, it looks like there isn't much of a difference in heritability for upper middle class um, uh, people versus uh, lower class people. And why might that be? Uh, I don't know what, what Eric says about that, but I think it's pretty clear because they have a much higher floor. Uh, there's a, the social network there, the social support 
uh, the schooling, the just the, the plain money. Uh, it's a different lower class in you. Actually, the first time I went to Europe, this is a very long time ago, was in Sweden. And after I'd been there for a while, I said, you know, where are the lower class people? <laughs> I mean, the baggage handler strikes me as looks like a acts like a college student. I mean, they, they don't seem to have lower class people. And uh, so it's a very, if this, what, what I just said is at all true, it's a very damning comment to make about the United States that we let people sink into such a, a low state that, that, that their genes are not able to pull them out of it. Uh, so at any rate, so that uh, anything else you want to know about intelligence I can talk about, but or, or any other topic. No, that was very helpful, especially the discussion of heredity, right? So I think a lot of people think of heredity as something that should be, um, because allegedly it's it's tracking variants in a population that's supposed to be related to genes, it should be the same across, uh, you know, all parts of that population. And, and what you're pointing out is actually the evidence seems to suggest otherwise, um, which tells us that like our intuitive notion of heredity probably isn't the one that's at work when people are you know reporting their statistics about um, these large samples of, of people and their intelligence and, and their life outcomes. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a great section of the book that I can recommend to, to lots of people. So you were just discussing lots of things about what this might say about uh, US uh, culture or maybe policies, um, the way that we handle people in different level, uh, different classes or um, <laughs> what we what the social mobility is in various parts of the US. Um, and it, that that got me starting to think about some of your work on culture within the US, not uh, not necessarily the, the type of uh, international culture that we were referring to earlier, say between East and Western uh, countries, but um, say between the North and the South, for example, is something that you and many of your colleagues have studied. And you've even, um, you know, even early on, uh, part of the the interest in these differences between, say, the North and the South or other just cultural differences within the U.S. was differences in violence or uh, things related to um, use of guns or attitudes about guns or gun policy and the like. Uh, and you have a, a lot of really interesting things to say there, especially given some recent events uh, and tragedies and, you know, uh, disputes about... Um, you know, guns and violence and, and police and things like this. Uh, one line from your book is, George Zimmerman would have gone to prison for killing Trayvon Martin if his actions had occurred in Connecticut rather than Florida, alluding to this idea that different parts of the country think differently about guns and violence and police and maybe race uh, and some other things uh, and ways uh, that suggest these cultural differences that you and your colleagues have have unearthed. So I wonder if you could say something about, you know, like how you got into the research or you know, what it, some of its implications might be uh, for people in our field or maybe beyond? Well, uh, this is this is the case where I, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you the truth as I know it. But uh, I, when I start to talk about the uh, North-South research, I point out that <clears throat> I grew up in Texas. And at the age of 17, I went to school in a foreign country, Boston. Uh, <laughs> things were so different that it was just dizzying. I mean, I came, first of all, I came from the desert and when I was experiencing spring in Boston, I felt like I was drowning. Uh, but uh, I, I found people in, in the North, the nor Northeasterners that I met uh, to be rude. A lot of them were quite rude. And uh, that was, well, that's different from Texas. There are people who are not rude like that, so casually. But uh, I certainly found a lot of things to like very much uh, in the Northeast, uh, including the fact that I began to realize that middle class people didn't kill each other uh, in the Northeast. Uh, and it wasn't a common occurrence where I came from, but uh, the, uh, to give you an idea of how widespread it was, at, at one point, the superintendent of schools uh, killed the um, school board president. Uh, 
or the or as I say, the other way around. I'm not sure which, but one of those says that ah, these are definitely middle class people. Uh, I actually have a relative uh, who shot her husband uh, when she caught him with the cleaning lady uh, and didn't kill him. Uh, and as I always say, but it did damage their relationship. <laughs> uh, so I sort of filed this fact about middle class people and homicide. And uh, I, I was going to start, I knew I wanted to study culture. I mean, but uh, I knew, you know, for uh, a white male to study culture is just a setup you know, for being critical, uh, how dare I? <clears throat> so I said, well, you know, I, I know something bad actually about white males. <laughs> that is, uh, they, they killed each other at a higher rate, I believe, in the South than in the North. And that's true, they do. We found that out by looking at uh, FBI reports. But we found out the extremely interesting thing about the nature of these homicides. Homicides that occurred in a situation where an insult would have been perceived were much more common in the South than in the North. The so-called 7-Eleven homicides where the, somebody shoots the guy behind the counter, that's equally likely in the North and South. It's just this insult situation that's different. So it's love triangles or insults in the bar or whatever, that's what's getting people killed. So, uh, I looked only at whites in the South. It's not a, so they're not tangled up with race uh, or uh, um, or anything else that we can identify. Uh, and uh, you know, the various attitudes uh, are are different in the South. Not across the boards about aggression or hostility or violence or anything else. You there you can ask unlimited numbers of of questions about violence, and you're not going to find that that Southerners are more in favor of it, except for the insult situation. Uh, they think it's more reasonable for somebody to uh, to shoot somebody who's um, making eyes at his girlfriend uh, in the South than in the North. Um, and the and the laws of the South are, as you started this conversation, the laws are are quite different. I mean. Uh, their corporal punishment is, at least the time we were doing the research, is okay in every Southern school. <laughs> and in many Northern schools, it's not okay. Uh, and uh, Southerners are always more in favor, Southern politicians, congressmen and women, are always more in favor of the war of the moment that the U.S. is involved in than Northerners, um, and uh, but then the the neatest thing we did, it, and this allowed us to use the word asshole in an abstract for a journal of personality and social psychology uh, report. We uh, dug up some Southern students at uh, um, at. Uh, who was I at the time? Uh, oh, it was at, at, at Michigan. There are some Southern students at Michigan. And we had Southern students and Northern students come in and they fill out a questionnaire. And we say, would you please take the questionnaire to the end of the hall? Uh, and on the way to that, it's a very narrow hall. And there's a guy at a file drawer that he's got open, he's working at it. And he has to push the file drawer in and make way for the guy to put down the, uh, the questionnaire. And then the, the, uh, the, sub, the subject re returns to the experimental room. But on the way, the guy with the file drawer has come, pulled the file drawer out again, started thumbing through it again. And so the, he has to get past it again. So the guy slams the door shut pushes the guy into the guy's shoulder and says, asshole. Um, and the reaction of Southerners and Northerners is very different to this. The, the reaction of the Northerners is, uh, 
I mean, yeah, what, what, what's with you? <laughs> what's with that? That's, that's ridiculous. The Southerners flash anger. Um, and in subsequent studies, we uh, measured testosterone and cortisol in these guys uh, before and after the incident. Uh, testosterone goes up for the Southerner if he's been insulted. Uh, the insult has no effect on the testosterone level of Northerners. So that they're being prepared <laughs> for dealing with uh, the Southerners. The Northern doesn't have to be prepared for anything. He's just, he's, he's, his reaction is already when it's finished. Oh, what the heck? Um, and cortisol is a measure of stress. So <clears throat> it's stressful and it prepares them for aggression. Um, so, um, at any rate, and I, I should say, this was done with Dove Cohen, who's now at the University of Illinois, who's a genius. <laughs> so uh, one thing I think is really interesting about this is, uh, uh, you know, actually within the same country, under the same government, we can find these pretty traumatic differences that produce, you know, that seem to be reflected in both behavior and as you're now alluding to, potentially even like hor hormones and, and things like that. And we, we alluded to how differences in class can also be relevant, right? You talked about how the heredity uh, related to intelligence is different uh, in different class groups. And in your book, as you're kind of going through some of the more auto autobiographical parts of your life, you talk a little bit about class and you talk about how at some points in your career, you were interacting with maybe students and faculty who were of a different class than you than you were from and, and maybe what that was like. I wonder if you want to talk about any of that or maybe elaborate on that um, here. The one thing that was quite interesting <clears throat> when I got to Yale, that was my first teaching job. And I looked at the class list for my seminar <clears throat> and 40% of the kids were a somebody, 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 the third or fourth. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a very strange situation. I'm the professor, but these guys are manifestly of a different social class. I mean, they're upper class. And I don't necessarily detect the behaviors. I can't tell, I can't tell by looking at these kids or by interacting with them what their class is, but you can rest assured they know what my class origins are, <laughs> which is lower middle class. So it was a, a funny situation. I mean, I, I um, you know, I had to, I had to behave confidently, regardless of the fact that I, the hired help, as far as, far as they're concerned. So, and they were quite respectful. I mean, I was, no one ever, you know, flashed their cufflinks and tried to make me feel not, not like a dope. So, so, but class is always, I mean, a a actually, it goes. My interest in class goes back to arriving at age 17 in Boston and seeing these people who were clearly lower class. I mean, whites who were clearly lower class. I didn't know people like that uh, in El Paso, Texas, when I grew up. El Paso was a caste system. I mean, there were the Hispanics and there were the whites. And, the, and, and you, I couldn't tell you any behavioral cues that would reveal social class in, in, in El Paso because it was kind of irrelevant. I mean, there were some people who had money and you might or might not know that, but there wasn't a different sort of behavior. Whereas in Boston, this, the, where you saw it in, in the Boston, the, it was the Irish, the Irish lower class. Um, and they were, they were, you know, quite, distinctly different. Uh, so, that, so that was interesting. And that, 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 must, that must make a difference. And then uh, Hazel Marcus has, uh, has shown us something very important about class. Um, but let me back up a minute and say that uh, the first really tremendously important work on culture by psychologists uh, was done by Hazel Marcus and Shinobu Kitayama. <clears throat> and they showed that uh, East Asians um, 
are have an interdependent life. That is, they 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 depend more on other people. They cooperate more readily with anybody they know. Uh, they are more influenced uh, by other people. And Westerners are more independent, uh, more likely to strike out on their own, more likely to be able to ignore what other people might want. Uh, and um, this difference, this difference in, in interdependence versus independence is found you know, in all kinds of domains. And, and it turns out that lower class people are much more interdependent and much less, much less um, individualistic. I mean, a very telling study that uh, Hazel Marcus did is to just ask people, um, college students who are either lower class origin or middle class origin, says, suppose you bought a new car and a friend of yours uh, uh, turned out to have just bought the same model car. How would you feel? Middle-class people say, oh, darn, man, I would hate that. I mean, you know, I, I bought this car because it was expressive of me. And there's this other guy trying to have the same signaling. I don't like that. If you, the lower class person say, well, oh, that'd be great. I mean, you know, let's start a car club or something. I mean, it would just, so it's, it's a, uh, that, that class is well understood in terms of interdependence versus independence. That's a, a late arrival to the Marcus work. That's, that's really interesting, you know, how class can maybe affect everyday life in a career, but um, maybe have, have broader implications in, 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 in everyday life, even outside of academia uh, and education settings. Well, you know, it certainly does have an impact. And, and this is the, uh, the most important thing that Hazel did, is to show she's at Stanford. And the, the whole messaging to these kids when they get into Stanford, uh, say, you're here at Stanford, and you're going to do great things, and you're going to be going to develop ideas and, and characteristics that will make you stand out and be successful and so on. This is very alienating to kids of lower class background. And, uh, and they, 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 they're awkward in, in, the, in the setting when it's described that way. And she, has, <clears throat> she shows that you get better performance of freshmen lower class kids, if you say, oh, this is Stanford, and it's gonna, you're gonna meet people that are gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna value and you're gonna learn stuff that you're gonna be able to take back to your families and your neighborhoods and so on. This interdependent uh, message uh, sets these kids up better for operating in this very individualistic environment. Um, and that actually makes me think, um, you know, you've just written a book that is uh, a memoir and it's got some autobiographical features and um, intentionally or unintentionally, I think it contains wisdom. And so I was wondering, you know, as, as you're talking to someone who's fairly early in their career and was not too long ago a postdoc and not too long ago before that a grad student and, um, you know, is looking ahead to what a career uh, would look like. And so I wonder, like, you know, as a uh, as you're writing this book, surely you're thinking of what things you wish you had thought of, or maybe what you think people, maybe my age or just a few years younger than me, ought to be thinking about, or maybe ought not to be so worried about, uh, as, as they're thinking ahead to a potential career as a researcher um, or instructor or both. I found my first year of teaching at Yale to be extremely stressful. I've had two auto accidents in my life. Uh, both of them, my first year as an assistant professor, <laughs> it was just, I mean, it was maybe more stressful for me than it would be for most people because there was a guy there who regarded me as his competition for tenure uh, at Yale uh, and uh, did everything he could to sort of pull the rug out from under me. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, it... I, you 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 make the, have the fundamental attribute. I mean, I'm I'm a screw up. I'm I'm so upset. I'm so worked up. I'm so you know I'm not handling things well. So 
uh, I thought, well, it's a, it really is a situation that's going to create that for an awful lot of people. So I found out a lot of people who would just become assistant professors in some field and sent them a message saying, you may well find it's, you know, there's lots of stresses and strains. It's a very different kind of situation. You're, you're you know, you're, you were always the underling, the student, the research assistant, and now suddenly you're the boss. It's it's the role has changed, uh, et, et cetera. And um, in the expectation that these people, I ask them all kinds of things, you know, their personal life, did you break up with your girlfriend? Did you have an automobile accident and so on? Uh, and what we did not find that it was on net in the advantage. What happened, however, was that people who got that letter, of course, we had a control letter which said, <clears throat> how are you, how do you like Carvel ice cream, whatever. And the ones who got the message saying, you know, it's, it may well be a tough time, either did better or worse on average than the other people. I mean, it's like some people benefited from that. Some people just, <laughs> I was look, it's bad enough without you telling me it's going to continue the whole year. <laughs> so I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I mean, I, I didn't pursue it, but uh, there was a variance difference. There was no mean difference. So I, I do think, you know, there's probably a way of saying what I did in that letter without it being unfortunate for anybody. Uh, and uh, but um, and I don't know how to tell your listeners who may be assistant professor somewhere. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how to do it till yet. I haven't. I haven't really worked through. It'd be an interesting exercise. What What could you tell people that would that would switch their attribution for their stress to the situation without making them feel like it's really a terrible situation there? I mean, uh, so. Uh, what other, what other things have I learned? Well, you know, I, whether it's age or knowing Lee Ross, who was my collaborator on many things, brilliant, brilliant guy, who, by the way, as I'm sure you know, wrote with Tom Gilovich, the wisest one in the room. And, and Lee was the wisest person. He was the, one of the very, very smartest people I ever knew. And he was certainly the wisest. I mean, so, uh, is so I, I recommend that everyone get a Lee Ross <laughs> to model behavior for uh, <clears> them. <throat> uh, I think studying East Asians and having the concept of interdependence and paying more attention to what's out there, to the context, to what other people want. That I used to be the terrible. I was the in a china shop. I'm in a, a meeting, you know, here's what I want to achieve, and I'm going to try and get anybody else to understand this. And I'm, I, I began to, no, no, <laughs> you, you need to present this stuff in, some, in a way that other people might be able to relate to and might be able to accept. I mean, pay attention to what, pay attention to the room. Uh, so uh, if anybody out there is as hopelessly individualistic as I was, uh, early in their career, you know, watch it. Look, look, look at, look at the the room. Well, given you know how individualistic many Western countries tend to be, uh, I would imagine there are many people who can learn something from trying to think more interdependently and holistically. Well, this has been a really great conversation, uh, Dr. Nisbet, and I really appreciate your time. But I am wondering if there are questions that you wish people would ask you that maybe they don't, or just topics that you find interesting that maybe don't often come up, uh, something like that, that you'd want to talk about or elaborate on. I actually am writing a book now, which has the working title, Cognitive Skill, Group Differences, and the Future of Social Justice. I mean, people are not thinking straight about cognitive skills. They're not thinking straight about the differences, group differences in cognitive skills. The, the book will have facts in it like this. There was a British psychologist named Isaac um, 50 years ago who wrote a, a nasty little book saying, you know, there are these race differences and they're largely genetic. And uh, he says, and, and oh, by the way, there's a 15 point gap 
in the IQ of the Irish and the English. And he had an explanation for that. So here's what happened in the 19th century. The smart Irish people got the hell out to Australia or the US and leaving the dumb ones there and the city. Well, about that same time, Ireland made a huge push in education at all levels, but with particular emphasis on immediate post-secondary school, what we'd call junior colleges or community colleges, which teach skills <laughs> that are quite marketable. Today, Irish GDP, per capita GDP, is higher than English GDP per capita. And Irish uh, children get uh, higher scores on cognitive tests than English children. So things are changeable. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to say things that are really optimistic and I hope helpful. Well, that is an excellent note to end on. And if it's anything like your previous books and this most recent book, uh, I would imagine I'm definitely going to be looking forward to reading it. Um, it's it's a, an incredibly good application of life lessons and then research lessons that apply in all sorts of ways inside academia, outside academia, and kind of in broader discourse, as you just alluded to. So thanks again for your time, Dr. Nisbet, and I uh, look forward to reading the next book. Okay, thank you. Thank you.